a few weeks ago, I got a scolding. It was sexy. <laughs> she got very stern with me. I was hanging out with one of my Spanko girlfriends and she was like, you know when your videos really piss me off when you pussyfoot around a topic, when I can tell you're not saying what you really think. So, you know, internally I was like, oh no, that's all of them all of the time. You see, a few months ago, I made a video inspired by David Ives one act play, Sure Thing. Buried inside that video was this moment. <laughs> So what's your name? Uh, my scene name's Bill. So what's your name? My scene name's Mike. Oh, uh, wait, what's, what's that noise? Can you hear that? Is it coming from in here? Oh, of course. I would recognize that sound anywhere. It's the sound of people writing comments. Oh lordy, did those four seconds make some people mad. That moment also inspired questions, all of which were fair, and assumptions, only some of which were fair. In the Spanko communities, scene names are ubiquitous and unquestioned. While I was working on this video, I could not find one single blog post or video or even a tweet challenging the idea that scene names are inevitable, mandatory, or benign. And that is absolutely banana pants to me. This community finds ways to argue about everything, but we can't even have a conversation about about this? How did that happen? How did scene names become this golden calf beyond reproach, beyond critique? So sure, I'll explain myself. But as much as I'd love to make strict mommy happy and drop a video all like, why I think your fake name is bullsh**. I know a spoonful of sugar will make this one go down easier. So I'm not here to scold. I'm here to celebrate. So here it comes kiddos. Open wide. It's going to burn a little, but who knows? It might even be good for us. Let's get the fine print out of the way. First, a real name is not necessarily the same thing as a legal name. I'm pretty sure most of the people who watch this channel already know that. For instance, my friend George's legal first name is Maximilian, but his friends and family all call him George. George is his real name. A fake name, on the other hand, is a pseudonym that a person chooses specifically to obscure a real name. Again, I think you all already know this. Second, I'm only talking about first names right now. Plenty of people have good reason to be judicious with their second names, since last names can kill plausible deniability and make an individual easy to track down. On top of that, last names are just overkill, right? Unless you're James Bond, you probably wouldn't introduce yourself to new friends with your last name at any other kind of social event. So why would you introduce yourself with your last name at a fetish party? Finally, I'm also not talking about usernames right now. Lover 92 online, if you must, at least that's obviously a username. No one will mistake that for a real name, so at least it's not going to deceive anyone. But when you're having conversations with other human beings, yeah, I just think it's weird to say your name is Philip when it's actually Steve. All right, let's do the thing. One, anonymity versus secrecy. There's a difference between anonymity and secrecy. Secrecy is toxic. Secrecy is what we did before, right? When we took our obsession, our identity, ourselves, and tried to make it all disappear. We're not doing that anymore. Secrets hurt us. Researchers at Columbia University found that secrets are associated with lower well being, less satisfying relationships, and even actual health problems like anxiety, depression, and disease progression. And cultures of secrecy, in my opinion, have similarly negative effects on entire communities. In Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism, author and linguist Amanda Montel writes about how adopting new names is one of the tactics cults and cult-like groups intentionally use to isolate new members in exactly the kind of toxic secrecy I'm talking about right now. A linguistic concept called the theory of performativity says that language does not simply describe or reflect who we are, it creates who we are. When repeated over and over again, speech has meaningful, consequential power to construct and constrain our reality. But resisting the allure of toxic secrecy doesn't mean that we all have to succumb to oversharing. And it certainly doesn't mean we have to put our own safety at risk, because there's another option. Anonymity. Anonymity is the thoughtful and healthy alternative to toxic secrecy. Here's what it looks like. Imagine Julia Roberts. She's one of the most famous and recognizable women in the world, right? But even she would be able to join an online fetish community under her real name without sacrificing her anonymity. If I made an online profile 
Belle for Julia, I would follow my own advice. I'd give her an avatar photo that emphasizes her humanity, maybe by using one of those cartoon photo conversion apps I recommended in a previous video. I'd include her real first name, and I'd even include real, but non-specific, information about her location and job. And this is what we'd end up with. No one would ever see a profile like this and immediately clock the Julia in it as the most famous Julia in Hollywood. This is what anonymity looks like. It's honest and sincere, but not excessively identifiable. But maybe you're tempted to argue that Julia is a very common first name in many English speaking countries. So here's the profile I would make for someone even more famous than Julia Roberts and with an even less common name. And yeah, sure. In this hypothetical, Barack would definitely get some lol, you have a lot in common with the former president comments. And he could just laugh those comments off because he'd still have plausible deniability. And plausible deniability goes a hell of a long way. I really can't overstate the value of plausible deniability. Did you just fart? <laughs> no. It was Daisy. If Julia Roberts and freaking Barack Obama could use their real names in online spaces and still retain their fundamental anonymity, I'm pretty sure the rest of us can too. Would Julia and Barack run into some challenges if, after making these profiles, they wanted to take the next step and actually go to a party? Yes. Yes, they would. At that point, at an in-person fetish party, I do think Academy Award winning actress Julia Roberts and Nobel Prize winning former President Barack Obama would struggle to retain their anonymity. <laughs> but like, why are we even talking about this? I don't have the specific set of challenges that two of the most internationally famous people of the century would hypothetically face. Do you? So that's the first thing I love about Spankos who use their real first names. They're cool enough to swim upstream. In a climate where seen names are normalized and unquestioned, they are choosing thoughtful and reasoned anonymity over toxic secrecy. They set a wonderful example for the rest of us, and that's a good thing because... two the appeal to safety fallacy. It's hard to criticize something like scene names. People love to say things like, I don't have to justify my right to protect myself, or it takes a lot of privilege for you to criticize the thing that makes me feel safer when you don't know my life. And that all sounds really good. It seems hard to argue with that. But those conversations remind me a lot of other conversations I've had. In the United States, personal safety is a big theme in pro-gun rights rhetoric. Access to firearms makes a lot of people feel safe, especially people who fall into physically vulnerable demographics, like women. When I've shared my opinions about gun control with people who feel safer with a firearm, they use exactly the same lines. I don't have to justify my right to protect myself, or it takes a lot of privilege for you to criticize the thing that makes me feel safer when you don't know my life. And that's absolutely true. There is no way I can know the backstory behind every choice to use a fake first name or carry a personal safety firearm. But in both cases, I think the criticism, or at very least, the questions and conversations are worth having. Because in both cases, I think their logic rests on what I'm going to call the appeal to safety fallacy. The logical fallacy of the argument that whatever makes a person feel safe is automatically good. I reject the philosophy that guns or fake names are above reproach just because they make some people feel safe. In both cases, I'm going to need more than just feelings. I want some evidence that these feelings actually do translate into real measurable safety improvements. Because if your feelings are all you've got to go on, well, my feeling is that fake names are actually making all of us less safe. Which brings us to three. Real names foster real safety. I love Spankos who use their real first names because I think they're making the fetish community safer for all of us. And here's why. Predators feed on fear. The overstatement of risk isolates newcomers and draws attention away from the legitimate threats. Look, we don't have great statistics about how often people get fired for involvement in fetish communities, but I can tell you that it does happen. In 2021, the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom received seven requests for help with job discrimination cases. Those statistics are anonymized, so there's no way to tell whether the discrimination in those seven cases was specifically related to BDSM or polyamory or something else but there's a lot of overlap between these communities and the bottom line is it does happen. But I can also tell you 
that when it does happen, the culprit is almost always someone the victim knew very well. You know, it's usually situations where a vengeful ex sends a screenshot to an employer, you know, that kind of thing. Even more common than job discrimination issues are child custody disputes, situations where involvement in kink or fetish communities is used against one parent in a child custody case. But again, these are almost always situations where the person who is weaponizing kink to hurt the other person is the ex-spouse. So unless you're planning to use pseudonyms for the entirety of all your serious relationships, telling people that your name is Michelle when it's actually Sophia isn't really going to mitigate that risk. And I do think that focusing on the legitimate threats will keep us safer. On top of that, when everyone uses a fake first name and no one thinks twice, abusers and predators get to do that too. You know that, right? Word of mouth and whisper networks are one of the most meaningful tools that people who fall into vulnerable demographics have to warn each other about potential threats. But the efficacy of word of mouth is pretty much neutralized when predators can use a different name for every party. I think fear is a lot like drop. When it attaches itself to something valid, it's it's more insidious and harder to shake. Safety threats are a valid thing to be concerned about, but that doesn't mean every proposed solution to that valid fear is itself also valid. Bankos who use their real first names are quietly creating a culture where abusers don't have that option. That's badass, and I'm grateful to them for it. Banko safety is a really important, complex, nuanced issue, and I'm not going to answer every question in a YouTube video because I don't have all the answers. No one does. But I do know the question of how to keep vulnerable people safe in sexual subcultures is really complex, and it's not going to be f***ing solved by this fake first name band-aid on a bullet wound bullshit for I love spankos who don't dick around with fake first names because I apologize. In penance for my outburst, I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge some scenarios in which I do think fake first names might make some sense. Obviously, I have to start with sex workers. Sex workers live under the very real and serious threat of state violence just for doing their jobs, and I am absolutely not here to question any measures sex workers take to protect themselves. I also want to mention teachers and other people who work with kids. Although, really, like I said before, the biggest threat of being outed to your employer does come from ex-partners or other people who know you very well, not from casual acquaintances who overheard your real first name at a party. I should also mention people who have serious stalkers or abusive exes, although again, I am concerned that fake first names are not a real solution to such a serious problem and may in some cases actually isolate victims and make them less safe. There are also people who are living with OCD, anxiety, or other clinical conditions that might make them more susceptible to paranoia or other symptoms and... You know, I'd say those people should definitely just listen to advice from their doctors or therapists about whether using a fake first name in the scene might be a helpful strategy to manage those conditions. Finally, I'll also acknowledge people who both live in extremely small towns and have extremely unusual names. But if you live in an extremely small town, I do think that's the detail to share with discretion. Instead of saying you live in Winnipeg Beach, just say you live in Manitoba. But if you're living under the threat of state or interpersonal violence, do whatever you need to do to stay safe, okay? I know I like to say a lot of snarky things about spankos who justify their toxic secrecy by appealing to high profile jobs and, yeah, I do think a degree of self-absorption does inspire a lot of these fake first names. No one else is thinking about us as often as we are thinking about ourselves. And we are probably not as famous as we think we are. I literally received formal graduate level training in how to track people down and I'm telling you, Googling first names is not it. I don't say any of this to be cruel, I say it because I find it reassuring. I love the way C.S. Lewis described humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. We aren't the only spanking fetishists in the world, and when we use fake first names unnecessarily for attention or for clout or to feel special, we send a message to other people that inspires them to isolate themselves. I know some people who think cis male tops should never use fake first names, but it's fine when bottoms do. And I do understand where that perspective comes from. Tops 
especially tops who are also cisgender men, are not the most vulnerable people in the BDSM communities. To me, a male top who is more worried about concealing his real first name from potential play partners than he is about resisting a culture in which predator tops also get to do that is making a selfish choice. I don't personally want to play with the kind of top who puts himself his name, his privacy, his risk above everything else. More importantly, now that I'm switching more often, I don't want to be that kind of top, do you? But although I understand why some people want to hold male tops to a higher standard than female bottoms as a female bottom, I just don't share that opinion. First, I think that's the kind of thing that sounds possible in theory, but would be really hard to implement in practice. Like. How do switches figure into this? And in an environment where fake first names are normalized in general, pretty much anyone can use them for whatever reasons they want, which to be clear is exactly the situation we're in. More fundamentally, I just don't think male tops owe me more than I owe them. I think my honesty and transparency make me a safer person and also make me a safer play partner to my friends. That's the kind of kinkster I want to be. I already said cis male tops are not the most vulnerable people in the scene, and that's true, but they are still vulnerable in some way. Ways. My friends and play partners deserve to get all of the same things from me that I expect to get from them. Honesty, transparency, authenticity, and accountability. And I just don't think the fact that I'm a woman changes that. If you'll forgive a moment of triteness, I think that our community and our world would just be a better place if we all started trying to give the same things that we expect to get. Five. Real names enable real friendships. If you've entered the fetish community, whether that's online or in person, it's because you're looking for something. Even if you're not looking for play partners, you're looking for understanding or connection or friendship, I know you are. And I just don't think real friendships can grow from behind fake names. Don't treat potential friends like potential enemies. For a seen friendship to become a real friendship, sooner or later, it needs to integrate into our real lives. A Spanko friend recently told me that she intends to invite me to her upcoming wedding and I am well aware that an invitation like that would never be coming my way if she didn't want me to know her real name. There are people who have spanked me or been spanked by me, and looking back, I'm not certain I know all of their real first names. There are people who have been inside my homes. I gave them my home addresses, and thinking back, I don't think I knew all of their real first names. And to be clear, that's 100% on me. It's my responsibility to be aware of my own boundaries and enforce them. So if I I'm only comfortable sharing my address with people whose names I know, it's my job to make that clear. At the time, I was just excited to have some people coming over. But in hindsight, yeah, it does make me feel weird. It makes me feel used. It makes me feel like some of us are offering up authenticity and getting knockoffs instead. A friend asked me, but does it really matter? If I'm being authentic about my feelings, intentions, desires, does a fake name really mean we can't be real friends? And I, yeah, I, I said, yeah, I do think that's what it means. If she can't invite me to her birthday party or whatever because her vanilla friends will all be calling her a different name, I don't think that's a real friendship. If she wins an award for being the very best translator in the universe, she's She's a translator. And she can't send me a link to the article in Translators Monthly celebrating her achievement. I just don't think that's a real friendship. Our scene lives are our real lives, but our off-scene lives are real too. If a friendship is only allowed to exist inside one box, I just don't think it's real. Real names enable real friendships, and real friendships, in my opinion, are absolutely the best tool sexual minorities have to keep each other safe. But do you know what else enables real friendships? <laughs> Honest conversation and the ability to share our different opinions without anyone freaking out. I don't want to live in an ideological echo chamber. A lot of my friends disagree with me on this issue, and that's okay. In fact, it's more than okay. It's a good thing. They've heard me out, and I've heard them out. In fact, several of them read this script before I filmed this video, and I've incorporated their feedback. So what's next? What am I asking for? Do I want new rules? Do I want to ban people who use fake first names? Do I think fake names are a consent violation? The answer to all of those questions is no. I don't think rules are ever the best way to promote cultural change. I think conversations are. So I'm not asking for new rules. I'm asking for new conversations. If you're using a fake first name, just ask yourself why. Is it necessary? Is it good? Even if you've got one scene name but choose to disclose your real name early on in your relationships with potential friends or play partners, honestly, I think you're just passing off the burden and responsibility of juggling these multiple names onto other people. And in that situation, my questions remain the same. Is that necessary? 
necessary? Is that good? It's easy to go with the flow and do things the way they've always been done, but sometimes there are better ways. I love and support all ethical spanking fetishists, but this video is my love letter specifically to all the spankos out there who are unapologetically kinking out loud with honesty, authenticity, vulnerability, and their real first names. And that, strict mommy, is what I really think. But like, if you want to come scold me some more, you, you've got my address. <laughs>